Hey everybody, it's Alex again, and, and I'm back to present on Killing the Kill Chain. So, some of you may ask, what's a kill chain? Uh, originally, the kill chain was a term used primarily by uh, you know, military groups to, to basically specify everything from you know, looking at uh, you know, what you want to accomplish, what's your objective, and looking at all the steps that are necessary to get to accomplishing that end goal. So Lockheed Martin has adapted this terminology to apply it towards information security, specifically to discuss an attacker's uh, methodology and the phases that they go through when they when they first are you know perform their early reconnaissance steps to their ultimate uh, accomplishment of their goal. You know what are all the steps that they would take along the way to get there? By mapping this out, not only can we have a better understanding of how an attacker may act at any given point of time, and, and thereby maybe learn what to watch for, uh, but we can also improve our ability to intercept these phases and keep the attackers from their ultimate objectives. So the goal for this session is to use this terminology, to, to use this approach to look at these different phases and discuss how we can best do this, to best detect uh, an intruder in action. And we're going to perform a live attack, and we're going to go through and, and line this up against the kill chain and look at the types of evidence that's created that can help you get on the attacker's tracks. So if we do this from a high-level view first, and we look at the preparation phase where they're performing reconnaissance and, and maybe doing some weaponization in their own internal labs as the attackers, uh, it's pretty hard to catch them in this phase because this type of reconnaissance is often something that, um, you know, it can be done over the Internet very easily. Uh, they, they can, uh, you know, say search your company on Google. It's, it's very easy to see what public facing systems are there and what their purpose is. Um, combine that with social engineering and other approaches, and it's, it's, it's often quite easy to get a little bit of information in the reconnaissance phase without getting caught or, or outed as an attacker. Uh, in addition, the weaponization is, in many cases, already accomplished by uh, hacking toolkits that are out there. Um, there's a number of different popular ones. Today we'll be using Kali Linux. Uh, and so a lot of that happens inside the attacker's lab. It's, again, it's very difficult to catch them. Now, uh, once you get into the delivery, exploitation, and installation phases, that's where you have the very best chance to catch the attacker and stop the attacker before they get to their end goal. Um, you know, when they're first hitting the server, when they're pushing their payloads, when they're trying to compromise systems, uh, this is really the best place to get in there and, and try and catch them. So we will uh, definitely take a look at this today. And there's a number of different uh, technologies out there. Um, Network IDS has classically been very, very popular and remains so to this day. Uh, host IDS, such as a, a tripwire, for example, you know, catching activity that's unauthorized on the host can be very, very helpful. Um, log analysis and SIM, very, very useful as well. And in many, many cases, when there is an attack, the evidence is right there in the logs. Um, antivirus, another classic solution, can be helpful with this, uh, as well as next generation firewalls at the uh, network layer. We'll get into all this in a lot more detail. Finally, uh, once there is an active breach, once the attackers are dug in, they're difficult they are more difficult to catch but it's not impossible there's oftentimes still signs uh, left over that, that helps you get on their tracks and perhaps re at least reduce the amount of damage uh, that's there um, particularly in this area you know you're going to rely on a lot of information from the hosts um, host IDS is again very useful log analysis sim um, database access monitoring can be pretty interesting and a access monitoring technology in general can be very very interesting when you're trying to you know catch a breach and and, and catch um, you know, outgoing data. And of course, DLP could be pretty handy as well. Unfortunately, though, once it gets to this phase, oftentimes uh, a lot of businesses find out that something's gone wrong from people like the FBI or the, the Secret Service or, or their customers, unfortunately, or sometimes banks. So um, that's, that's what we want to avoid. Uh, we want to catch the attackers as quickly as possible so we can minimize, if not completely eliminate, the damage. So let's move on to our example here for today. Homer is our bad guy in this scenario here. Uh, he is the attacker on IP 
66 on 66 on 66. <laughs> and uh, Homer has spied his target. Uh, he's performed some reconnaissance on there. He's determined that, the, that um, this company that he's attacking uh, has some credit cards that he'd like to steal. And so this web server, uh, appropriately named Web, is an online store that Homer may be able to uh, break into and potentially steal some credit cards from. So uh, let's jump onto Homer's machine here. If I go to this attacker system, Homer's running Kali Linux here. And um, so he's found that system and its IP. He might want to pop open a browser since the web server, it's free and very easy to go in and, and look at that web server and see you know, what's going on. Uh, looks like they have here our online store and you can go to their order processing area here and check it out. Uh, now, while Homer's investigating this system, you know, of course he's got the IP, but now he also can understand that, that it's running a um, CGI script. And so at this point, there are many different ways that you can um, decide to proceed as an attacker and that we might have to be worried about as a defender. Um, however, a CGI script is a good target because it's running code on the web server. And in many cases, if it's not patched, it could be vulnerable to attack. Um, so uh, Homer here knows that um, there are a lot of systems still vulnerable to a lot of the classic vulnerabilities that have been around for for some time now. Uh, vulnerabilities like Shellshock as an example. You know, you, if you have an unpatched Apache instance from uh, about a year ago, then you, you probably are going to be pretty vulnerable. Um, so he's going to take a shot at that. Here Homer is, is in his shell here and uh, basically he has a little script to try and exploit systems uh, for if, if they're vulnerable to shell shock, if we're trying to exploit that. Uh, so here with this get shell routine here, if I run it here, it gives me the usage for for his script. And so if I go in here, I need to specify my IP. So ultimately, if the if the system is compromised, it knows who to communicate with for my back door. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in Homer's IP here. Uh, and then we also put in the URL of our target, which was this one. And specifically, we want to target that order.cgi script. And uh, basically, for this particular script, it's looking for a type of system. We'll guess Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So basically we're running that routine and it's attempting to compromise the system with Shellshock. Uh, what this little shell script does is it compromises the system with Shellshock and then elevates privilege by um, basically injecting yet another shell script onto the system that we're attacking. Now, if all goes well, this little terminal window that spawned is something that we can use to run commands on the remote system. So, Homer here might test and say, uh, let's see, host name is a good one. And it does look like we are on that, that web system. Uh, we can also see what directory we're in with PWD. Uh, clearly Linux commands are working and we're seeing Linux paths. Uh, and you know, you can also see who am I. You know, like you see in this case, I got root access. In many cases, if I compromised an Apache system, I'd be running as the Apache user. But in this case, I've actually got root. As the script has been able to elevate from Apache to the root user. Now, let's see. What would uh, Homer want to do here? Well, we've broken into the system, but but just breaking into the web server is not going to help him very much. Um, so there's a couple of different things that, that we might want to do. Uh, one of the things that we could do is discover maybe um, maybe there's some nearby systems that we could learn more about. If I run ifconfig here to look at my network information, I can see a lot of information about that web server and what's going on there. I can see that, yes, there's, there's this public IP that we expected, uh, that we attacked it on. However, now we start to see some internal subnets here, this uh, 10.34 here. And it looks like this server also lives in a different subnet as 20.34. So definitely pretty interesting there. And um, basically, that gives the attacker enough information to, to say, maybe do some more scans to learn 
you know, where can I go from this web server? What can I what can I find? If my goal is uh, credit cards, you know, extracting that information, then I'm probably going to look for a database. So returning to our slides here briefly, uh, Homer has found this system and compromised it with Shellshock. From here, we've learned that there are more IPs and more networks that this system is living in, and we might be able to pivot to a new address. We'll do a little bit of reconnaissance and see if we can find the backend database uh, for this web server. We'll go back to Homer's attacking system here. Now, um, I'm still on this system, and I've seen this, this different subnet, 20.34, so that one looks kind of interesting to me. I might run an nmap scan from here, being it's a Linux system. Good chance that we'd have that available. And I want to scan that slash 24, so everything under 20 dot and see what's there. Now we'll give this a minute here. We'll let it run. Uh, basically, uh, this, this uh, reconnaissance stage will discover uh, that uh, not only is there uh, you know, more going on in that subnet, but there is a database server in that area. And maybe that would have the sensitive information, in this case, credit cards, uh, that we're looking for. Let me return to my attacker. Um, yep, and it finished about 15 seconds. Uh, so the scan found ourselves, and it also found this 20.40 system, uh, which goes by the name of DB. Uh, the attacker would also be able to tell that it is a Postgres database based on this simple nmap scan uh, and potentially that they could break in with, with SSH if they could guess uh, passwords or, or guess users and passwords combinations. They could also break in that way. Um, so assuming the hacker has, you know, some time to look at this information, say, hey, there's a Postgres database, they can, they can decide, how do I want to attack that system? Um, it, this is where that weaponization phase from the kill chain comes in a little bit more. I mean, first you've got your shell shock payload that was created, uh, but you, you also might have, uh, like, uh, you know, you have time to think about it and create a, a hack for Postgres after you've learned a little bit about the environment, learned that it's there. So, uh, here, the attacker might want to host uh, oh, uh, the attacker might want to host their attack here on their home system, their local system, uh, to basically uh, be able to push that uh, from their system, their host, to the web server that they've compromised. Uh, using this shell shock session that's still running, I can come back here as Homer and uh, I can run a wget to grab that file. Actually, let me cd to temp first. Make sure I'm there. Yep. Uh, and I'm also going to grab that file, as I mentioned, from my hacker's IP here. And that is pghack.sh. So here I've moved this, this basically hacking toolkit into the temp directory here alongside some of the other stuff that the, the um, initial compromise is pulled across. And I also want to make that executable. So I'd ch, ch mod that, give it uh, the ability to execute, making it possible for the attacker to run this new malware on the system. Now, before I push further and have a greater and greater chance of, of getting caught, uh, it might make sense for me, as Homer here, <laughs> uh, to dig in a little bit and, and give myself a backdoor. Of course, I could always try to exploit Shellshock again later, but that might be patched, so creating another way in is very, very common. Uh, in this example here, why don't I just make myself the user Homer? user add homer and uh, here with the with the user homer there I've got a blank user and we can kind of play with that a little bit as we go a little bit further on but um, let's go ahead and execute the hack uh, I need to find out uh, how this hack works here because unlike homer I don't have it memorized <laughs> 
Uh, and so basically it looks like I just need the database IP and an output directory um, for the results from the exploit attempt. So I may try to hide this here in uh, temp here alongside this. Uh, I could perhaps save it there, but the problem is going to be if I save this information from the database, then well, it may not, um, it may not be immediately ex uh, accessible to me uh, from my host system, you know, where I'm starting from as an attacker. So, why don't I just go ahead and put it on the web server? If I cd to, uh, well, I'll do an ls var www html. Looks like there's just plain old index.html there. So if I'm able to compromise the database server and save those files at the root of the web server, I'll be able to access them via my local systems browser. So that's what we're going to try. Uh, if I run temp uh, pghack.sh, uh, we had the requirements to put in the database IP, so I believe that was uh, 2.168.20.40. Let's see. 20.40, yep. Uh, 20.40. And then I also need to specify what directory to save the database dump to. So basically this script, I'm going to run it through, and basically what it's going to do here is it's going to try a bunch of different user and database name combinations in order to brute force uh, the Postgres database. And you see that it's very, very common that you see like many, many failures when this attack is, is happening. A lot of failed logons are happening. And, and so um, that's something that we'll actually take a look at as we review the attack, how this attack could have been caught in the many different places. Uh, but here it failed many times. And then finally, the, um, the user and database combination of Postgres Postgres uh, was able to access the system, getting in with, by the way, the default password, never a good thing, <laughs> uh, and then saves that information to this Postgres uh, database dump. Um, so if I go back here to the slides, just to update you on the the play-by-play -play here. <laughs> uh, so we discovered that there was the, the database system and that there was indeed uh, you know, a database there we could access and it was using default credentials. Uh, now, so we are into the database. We were able to extract that database information and pull it back to the web system. Uh, unfortunately for the defender in this case, that system was the back-end system for the payment application. So some credit card information has been successfully pulled to this jump point uh, and, and we're getting further and further along in our phases as the attacker. Um, to take a look at this, if I go back into the attacker system, I'm viewing the, the web server remotely and um, you know if I, if I go in and maybe take a look at some of those files, we'll cat uh, those files. Well, actually I need the, the names. so. I'm going to go there and take a look at what they're named. Um, okay, so there was the, the Postgres dump was the one that succeeded. So db dump dot post oh, Postgres ooh, dot Postgres and yeah, we've definitely got some good information there. Uh, and it, let's see here, inside the database, we were able to find ah credit cards here for several different users and their expiration dates, as well as some some basic information about um, the customers. Now this isn't real credit card data; it's just an example of how and this types of thing, type of thing could be pulled out. Uh, but the important thing is we've shown how you can break into a, um, a database server and, and sensitive information can be extracted via a really, really common uh, situation where you know, people are using default passwords. Maybe they were, you know, they had their passwords for their individual users are adhering to password policies, but maybe not for the built-in admin, which is ex exceptionally common. And yet another reason why you really, really want to do vulnerability scans and make sure that you, know, you don't have default passwords in place, especially for really standard, uh, you know, services like databases and web servers. Um, so 
that said, um, it looks like the, the database dump was complete. Now, to get the, system, the, the credit card information back to uh, Homer's system, uh, if you remember, we saved it in, uh, saved it in the web server here. So if we just kind of go back here and we've got this dbdump.postgres file. Uh-oh, better be quick. <laughs> um, you can see that um, basically this information is here. The, the name, credit card number, all this stuff, and this could be exfiltrated uh, out at this point, and, and the, the kill chain would be complete at this point. So I think Homer deserves his uh, victory dance here so, because the information has been successfully exfiltrated, so we'll give him his credit in this alternate reality. <laughs> uh, but really the the idea here is uh, how can we look at each of these stages and at what points could we have stopped Homer from reaching his objectives there, getting all those credit cards moved back to his you know, remote system. So to that end, um, let's review, starting at the top. In the reconnaissance phase, as I mentioned, is very, very difficult to catch people on this stage. Uh, there are few options. But one of the things you can do is discover what can be seen. Google your own company. Um, Google hacking database is another interesting way of, uh, you know, kind of inspecting yourselves from a, a hacker's perspective. Um, Nmap scans, discovery scans, uh, vulnerability scans, identify, you know, your current state. Gain situational awareness in terms of network topology and really uh, a good understanding of where your crown jewels are. If someone was to attack me, what would they get? What would they want? Um, understanding this before you're attacked can be very, very helpful. That said, there's a lot more that you can do to catch the attacker in these phases where they're weaponizing, uh, you know, they've, got, they've, got, they've created their attack and then they're delivering it and exploiting systems. This is where you have your best chance. Um, you can, of course, prevent the attacks by not having ancient vulnerabilities from, you know, <laughs> a year ago. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, new vulnerabilities will pop up, and you got to keep those patched. Make sure you identify where the gaps are. Patch, patch, patch. Um, close unnecessary ports. Make it harder for an attacker to uh, attack you and also harder for them to profile you. Um, network IDS, you know, things like Snort, just completely awesome at catching these types of attacks. Uh, brute force attacks, things like that. Um, exploit attempts. Um, for example, shell shock. You know, we there's a, there's some very common patterns that can be seen inside uh, you know network traffic that can indicate somebody's trying to attack you with shell shock. Network IDS is great at picking this out. Automated review of logs can also be helpful, as well as monitoring for unauthorized host activity. So let's take a look at some quick examples of this. Um, if we go into our web server, one of the two that was attacked here, uh, and we go and take a look at our logs, and uh, you know, there's a couple telling signs. If we look at the error log, I'll blow this up a little bit so you can see it. Um, there's a couple things that are interesting. You know, pre premature end of script headers. We can tell that something on the CGI side, specifically with order.cgi, is not working. Something's not going very well with that. Um, sometimes, in many cases, you'll see that these are all over the place. Maybe there's a, you know, a bug in, in your web code. Uh, but if you don't normally see these sorts of messages and they start appearing, it may be worth taking a look and seeing you know, who is the client in these cases. Who is actually trying to access the web server when it has these problems. Uh, if I go back, in addition, looking at the access logs can be very telling. So, especially with this one, uh, here, if you look at the access logs, uh, there have been GET requests against order.cgi, and uh, if you're at all familiar with Shellshock, this pattern may stand out to you here. Um, this is the sequence that, that can be used, one of the several ways it can flow, uh, to exploit a system that's vulnerable to shell shock to run arbitrary shell code. And following this, you will see arbitrary shell code. <laughs> um, basically, here, you know, for example, here's the, um, the little malware here designed to pull elevate.sh, uh, which we use to get root automatically as part of our script. Uh, and then the, the uh, Shellshock exploit also made that script executable. And then, um, you know, hosted a netcat listener 
using that shell code. So very tricky, uh, and it, you know this is one of those things where in the access logs themselves, the information is just there to be caught. It, and it's possible to write your own, um, you know, handwritten uh, parsers, just simple regex, you know, grep statements can catch this type of thing. However, uh, it's also very handy if you have a, a, a log management platform like our, our Tripwire Log Center, for instance, fantastic at catching these anomalies and alerting you in a real time fashion when they happen. Um, so that's some evidence from the web system. If I uh, cancel this one here, yeah, let's close this terminal. And then uh, we also have the DB system. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll log into that one. And um, you can also see in the Postgres logs, a very similar situation here. So if I have, uh, let's see, it's Postgres, yeah. Uh, oops. Less the Postgres logs from here as root. Um, you can see the the brute force attempt is here. You know, connection refused, connection refused, connection refused. So here, in hidden amongst our logs, are, it, it, are we have evidence that, that the attack is underway very clearly. It's just a matter of sifting through this massive portion of logs and finding the interesting info. Again, something where you, if you have a log management platform, log intelligence platform like Log Center, very very handy. Um, in addition, uh, with Tripwire Enterprise, uh, we have this fantastic ability to um, go to these systems and take a look at what's going on on them. So if I log into my Tripwire Enterprise deployment here, then uh, we can take a look and see what's going on. If you are monitoring your systems for integrity and catching unauthorized changes is a fantastic way to get onto an attacker's tracks and stop them from moving further forward. Here we can see there's 15 changes that were created uh, as uh, Triple Enterprise was watching during this attack. Uh, there were many systems, uh, system modifications here like elevate.sh, PG hack, the addition of these shell scripts was caught. Uh, as a user was added to the system, we caught that. Uh, and also with the database dumps showing up in our web route is something that we caught. Finally, something that's pretty telling is listing ports. It's another thing that's really, really interesting. So you can see here with like TCP, uh, we were suddenly listening on uh, uh, and communicating to uh, port 8080 on the attacker system. And um, you know if this is something that falls outside of your profile of expected communication, um, that can be pretty interesting too. Um, so that said, you know, there's a lot of things you could do to try and catch them there. Um, the same thing goes as they try to export the information. You know, monitor, you know, try and catch sensitive information. If you see people creating uh, database dumps, if you see files that happen to have, uh, in you know, patterns of sensitive data in like credit cards, things like that, catch that. Use, use automation to catch that. Tripwire is a great platform for that with Tripwire Enterprise. Uh, and then, of course, reviewing logs, as we saw before. It could ultimately be pretty frustrating for the homers of the world. <laughs> Um, so that said, uh, we are running out of time. So uh, I'll just conclude here with the fact that you know there are many different steps an attacker needs to be successful. But if you catch them quickly, you can kick them out before any real damage is done. Even if you catch them while they're doing damage, you can reduce the impact. So I hope you found this presentation helpful, and good luck killing the kill chain.